to the Untold Stories of Real Estate Investing, hosted by Wayne Courageous III, a place where active and passive investors come to hear the good, bad, and ugly of real estate investing. Our guests consist of experienced operators and investors who want others to succeed by sharing their stories. If you're looking to syndicate deals or grow your wealth passively in real estate, you've come to the right show. It's now time to sit back, take mental notes, and enjoy our next episode of The Untold Stories of Real Estate Investing. Welcome to the Untold Stories of Real Estate Investing. I'm your host, Wayne Courageous. For our next episode, we're excited to have Ruben Greth back with us. Ruben has been a popular podcast host about raising money for multifamily syndication, where he learns from the best multifamily syndicators in the country. 2019, Ruben partnered with a local syndicator on the acquisition of 190 units and has since become a fund manager who is building $48 million worth of subdivisions in Louisiana and Alabama and partnering with multiple select syndicators bringing equity, advisory, and investor management. Welcome to our show, Ruben. Thanks, brother. Really excited to be back. I, I'm, I, have you had more than one person come back and be a multiple guest? No, no. Am I but the first? I, I'm no, the, am I the you're first? You're welcome Woo! every time because <laughs> uh, one, I already told you before this show, like you're just easy to talk to the time, time goes. <laughs> and uh, you've got a lot of knowledge. And we're partners on one of these $48 million on worth of crest. subdivisions. Yeah. Uh, last, uh, you know, hey, people listening out there, relationships, partnerships matter. And when we connected through a mutual mutual uh, friend through real estate um, to, you know, that's how we got connected on a podcast last year. But, you know, we, as you, you know, as you know, but audience doesn't know, like we connected afterwards when we were able to partner on a, a deal and uh, outside yeah. Lafayette. So that's an exciting project that's going on right now. But so anyway, welcome to our show, Ruben. Welcome back. Thank you, thank you. What's been going on over this last year? I think last we recorded in October 21. So what have you been up to? So at the beginning of the year, I did a post of the top 10 shows of all time. And Richard Wilson was ranked like number five. And he didn't that didn't sit well with him. So he's like, hey, man, you know, like, how do I get to number one? Like, I'd like to buy your show, you know, at least a percentage of it, you know, what, what do you think it's worth? I'm like, well, Adam Adams, he just sold his show for, for, I think like 50 grand. He's like, well, how about I, I, uh, pay $10,000 for 10% of your show. And I'm like, no, dude, you're going to buy 50% of my show. And you're going to do all these other things for me. And I like, you know, forced his hand to do all these other things for me. And now he's going to help me write a book. So we're in the process of co-authoring a book. That's a new development. I have a friend with the coaching program and his uh, team that helped him create his coaching program reached out to me and they're like, Hey, we think that you should be a capital raiser coach. So they're helping me create a program. I'm in the middle of three capital raises. So things have been going crazy. Those numbers are a little outdated. We have a hundred unit, 150 unit, and a 220, all 506C deals that we have in the pipeline right now. It's been a crazy ride this year. And sometimes it's a little overwhelming, man. You know, there's a lot of other things, you know, being a, a business owner and running legacy acquisitions, the team meetings, the co-GP calls, and then being a podcast host. That's just like, whoo. Like, do you ever get to to take a break? And, you know, for me, you were talking about consistency early, mm -hmm. earlier. I've released at least one or two episodes every week for about 40 months straight. And like, sometimes it, it makes me want to throw up. I just like, God, like, I need to get away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but well, overall, I mean, the journey is like, fantastic. I mean, your, your podcast, I mean, is serious, right? I mean, and not that this podcast is not, but I mean, we're doing one or two a month. Uh, and you know, it's, to, it's to really help those out there that are wanting to learn more about passive and actively investing, you know, they, but you're out there hustling two times a week. Have you thought about, you know, bringing on a co-host and having, you know, sort of that shared split work? Not right now, not right now, not till I believe. I don't know where this quote came from, but they said in order to master something, you have to study it for 10,000 hours. Mm -hmm. I believe I'm at about 5,000 hours of capital raising training. So once I get to 10,000 hours, 
I think I could potentially get somebody to take over the show. Cause the whole idea, you know, I was talking to my, my capital raising coaches and they've been training a bunch of us on how to, to raise capital. And they're like, Hey, we're going to launch this thing called um, the real estate accelerator 2.0. I'm like, well, what is it they're going to do in 2.0 that you haven't already taught people? And they're like, we're going to teach them, you know, they've already created businesses, created funnels, automations, created avatars. They've started, you know, generating wealth for families, for themselves. And, you know, they have successful businesses. Now, 2.0 is we're going to teach them how to extract themselves from the capital raising business so that somebody else is running that for them in the middle of capital raises while they're kicking it in France, you know, on vacation. And I'm like, oh, oh my God dude like my mind exploded so i'm just like i'm just about to start my own capital raising program and like to get to the level where they're at is you know it's it's scary right you're just like how how am i going to provide the same value that they are but you know you start you start where you start and it's it's a very bad idea to compare yourself to others you can only compare yourself i think you know in a good way to who you were yesterday or who you were 12 months ago, instead of comparing yourself to other people. Like, for example, I came up right around the same time that Zach Captain stalled did, you know, and mm. he was doing his first deal at the same time that I was doing my first deal. And now he's got like 200 employees and he's got a billion and a half dollars worth of real estate. And, you know, I feel like a peewee compared to him, but there's somebody in the audience or somewhere in my audience, that's just like, man, like you're, you have $48 million plus of deals under, un, under um, construction right now. Like you, you know, they're comparing themselves to me, you know? So yeah. it's just like uh, the story that Tim Brott said on my show, he, he uh, did a mastermind on a yacht and went like into the Caribbean or something. And he's feeling all like amazing. And then he came back to the Harbor and there was a yacht that was like, 12 times bigger than his yacht, you know, with 30 employees. And he's just like, oh, damn, I thought I had arrived and I just got <laughs> put back into my place and got humbled. Right. So yeah. I, I, you got to remain humble at humble. all times. And, you know, we're, we're recording this in December uh, and times to, you know, look at goals for the next year for 2023 and all. And you're, yes, you're right. I mean, you've got to, you've got to stay in your zone, whether whatever industry, whatever you're in, um, you've got to, look at what, you know, I'm always about goals, right? And I've got a spreadsheet. I think I might've mentioned this on my podcast previously, but I have a spreadsheet and it breaks down categories like family, finances, vacation, charity. And so I try to make goals and then I color coordinate. It's pretty, pretty, probably sick. Uh, There's very few people that do stuff. Very like few, few I have people. something similar, but in my phone, I have, I have what I call an intention statement that goes through, like, it's like, it takes me 17 minutes, to, 17 minutes to read it. So mm. it's long. It's, it's going to cover the same stuff that you're talking about. Yeah. Highly and recommend also, that it, if you guys take anything from this podcast, write your goals down and review them as often as possible every day, preferably, but you know, life gets in the way, but if you can do that, that, that would be the biggest takeaway that I can present here today. Yeah. All right. We're done with our show. My drop. <laughs> hey, uh, also vision boards. Yes, man, that's one. powerful. I, um, you know, two years ago, created a vision board, and um, it's pretty. I mean, through my mentorship, shout out to James Kanasami. Uh, oh, I like him. I yeah, he's, I've he's never met guy. him, but I hear. But no, things. his, his, uh, you know, his mentorship program. That's like his first episode, uh, first like series. You know, classes. Uh, mindset and vision board. And um, so that's what I did, uh, you know, create this vision board of, you know, where we wanted to be at. And, you know, we're, we're, we're not, those were really lofty goals, but the vision, it it's pretty cool to see, okay, well, that's where we were. And this is where we're at. The other thing I'll say, Ruben is be careful social media and be okay to unfollow some people. You don't have to unfriend them, but unfollow, because sometimes that can make you feel, you know, at least for me, I can speak for myself. It's like, okay, yeah, they're really knocking out of the park or the perception is they're really knocking out of the park. And then you start questioning what you're doing. So um, that's another thing too. So vision board and be careful with social media. It's not just the kids that sometimes can get impacted mentally by that. Good stuff. So, uh, all right. So 
very beginning, um, one of the things that you mentioned, and this is why I love talking to you, is I just had this plan. Now we're going off it. Like, let's talk about books. <laughs> okay. So what what's the process of a, writing a book? That's something that I've uh, thought about doing actually on the asset management yeah. piece. But like, what had they, I mean, Man, are you working on- I've, I've been procrastinating about it for about a year and a half, and I've learned a couple of different strategies to do it. I think the most popular one is to is to just record yourself about specific topics and then turn it over to uh, someone at Upworks that can rewrite it into mm-hmm. coherent, you know, um, content that can be released as a chapter. And my co-author Richard Wilson, owner of the Family Office Club, he's written like thirteen books. This will be his fourteenth. We kind of got together just a couple of days ago. And I suggested to him, I'm like, why don't you make a list of 20 chapters that you could potentially write about? And then I'll write a a list of 20 chapters that I could potentially write about. And, you know, his whole idea is like he likes to create pamphlets, not like 400 page books. Hmm. So like maybe 10 chapters, five pages on average each for each of us. And then we just we either write it down because I'm pretty positive I can write five pages on any given topic, you know, of the things that I decided that, you know, avatar creation or fund creation or, you know, raising from limited partners versus JVs versus funds versus co-GPs. I could talk about that for five minutes or five pages easily on each one. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're in the process right now where we're dissecting each other's suggestions and seeing which ones overlap. And then you know, that's, I'm hoping I'm kind of pushing his button and pressing. I'm like, I'd like to, I've been procrastinating about this for a long time. I want to have this thing written by January 21st, which is my birthday. Hmm. And he's like, yeah, we can do that, man. One time somebody challenged me to write a, wrote a book and uh, he got on a red eye flight, I think from New York. And when he landed in Oregon, like six hours later, the book was done. So I was wow. like, geez, like, so. I guess you can do it that fast if you want to. I mean, some people talk about it, it took me seven years to write a book and other <laughs> people are just like, hey, you know, what? you can do it faster or or you can just record yourself or there's a variety of things that you can do. But th- those are some of the kind of like my general base thoughts on that. Yeah, I love that. And you're actually, I mean, what's cool is you, you know, I saw on, on Facebook a couple of weeks ago, someone out, went out there and asked like who who are people that can author books or, you know, ghostwrite. And there's a lot of people out there that ghostwrite, but what you're doing and what I'd like to do is you're, whether you're writing it or you're talking through it, it's your information. It's your value. It's your experience. It's that 5,000 hours that you've put into this already. I'm just, you know, throwing that out that you've, uh, you've worked, all these hours to be a master at the trade of capital raising and you know, you're, you're putting it out there in another form of education, whether it's podcast or talking, et cetera, you know, people want to read that stuff too. So, and then you can get into an audio book. I don't want to turn the tables on you, but what would, what would you be interested in writing a book about? Oh, so one is straight up passive investing. I've got a, a monthly, a meetup that we do and I'll bring in, and we've got over a thousand members that are part of our meetup and we've got a good 30 to 50 people per, per meetup uh, virtually, but I'm very passionate about education. It's part of the reason why we do this podcast, you know, uh, is, is to educate and more so on the passive side, passive investors. So really trying to be as transparent and, you know, good, bad, and ugly of passive investing. But the other thing is, is, is asset management. So how to, yeah. you know, the, the hard the, for me, the hard part, because I'm very much of an introvert, like even this podcast, it, they're so hard for me to sometimes do these because I'm just very introverted and people who know me know that, you know, I rather watch the grass grow uh, <laughs> than be around people. Like I'm, that's why we live out in the country. But when I'm in my best and my most comfortable Ruben is day one of closing. Cause then it's like all about, I've done that for the last 15 years. It's asset management. It's day-to-day operations. It's teamwork. It's leadership. That's a big it's fun. Rush. That, that's, that's when I'm enjoying the most. So uh, a lot of information and there's some really great books out there um, already, but you know, I think, you know, even though there's other books and other authors, there's 
still value and information that each one of us and those that are listening that have those type of tidbits and, and experience to, uh, to put out there. So that's a goal of mine. Um, and, but I need someone to write it. I mean, I'll, I'll put out the info. I love the idea of doing like a recording. Um, I thought about typing it as much as I can, but uh, one, the time to goes into a book and, uh, and then just straight up. It's easy to arts. procrastinate when you do it that style. Yeah. I, I think I've tried some of that. I've written like one chapter. <laughs> so I, th- I think I'm going to speak it into existence rather than write it into existence. Yeah. I, I turned off my phone for this podcast, but I've written out chapters for my asset management one. Oh, so good for you. I, at least I have the title name. And you probably have like 5,000 hours of property management, asset management. Oh, easily. That's what I do day, that's more, what I, right? that's what I'm, so. every day of my life for 15 years. And even on the weekends, I mean, I'm, that's just, I'm, the, the thing I love most about our industry is it's not work. If you view this as work, commercial real estate, uh, it, it's going to kick your ass. Like it's just painful, like up, down, like, but if it's a like, I don't say like a hobby, but it's something like you just enjoy doing. Like, I'm sure there's people that just enjoy That's... arguing in court as lawyers or, <laughs> or medical, you know, saving, you know, the, the feeling it. of being able to diagnose and save people. I don't know. So for me, it's, it's... it's an interesting topic to contemplate here yeah. because- Okay. So I had a, I was talking to my personal development coach, Kate and Patel for a little while, and he was interviewing me, trying to determine how he could help me. And, you know, I was kind of rambling on about my story and kind of telling him, you know, I'm afraid of success. And, you know, like, you know, here's uh, some of the things that I'm accomplishing. He's like, wait, 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 go back. Did you just say you're afraid of success? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, okay, so ex- you got to explain that to me. And I'm just like, well, you know, like I don't, want to be trapped into a box where I feel, you know, like I have responsibility and I can't get away and you have to out hustle and outwork people. And like, that just makes me sick to my stomach. Like, I don't want to have to outwork the Logan Freemans of the world. And, you know, these people that just work, 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 and you know, they, they're doing so much more than I ever want to do. No. And he's like, dude, you got this all wrong, brother. Slow down. What if I told you that there was a way for you to work less than you're currently working and make five to 10 times more than you're currently making and help a bunch of people along the way. And dude, I literally started crying because he redefined my definition of what success meant Hmm. and made it feasible for me to get step, step into this. Right. So, and I talked to, here's what I wanted to bring up too, is because I, I talked to my wife and she's like she understands passive income and she tries to do network marketing but she always fails and it's because she doesn't love it Hmm. like i would literally do the capital raiser show actually i do the capital raiser show for free in fact i pay out of my own pocket to make it happen i love it that much where i don't care if i make a dime because i'm so excited about the information and the potential for me to turn this information into you know the ability to help people and the ability to help myself and the ability to to help my future family. And so I've been telling her, I'm just like, you have to find something that you absolutely love or else you're never going to have success in it. And, Mm. you know, maybe what you're talking about is when you absolutely love something, it's not work. But at the same time, I find myself doing all this crazy stuff, like running myself silly, even though I know I shouldn't be working as hard as I'm working I find myself working myself to the point of exhaustion on a regular basis. And like, I just, sometimes I need to figure out a way to just take a break. Like maybe I should shut down the capital reserve show for two weeks, or at least figure out a way to automate it while I'm on vacation somewhere else. It wouldn't be that complicated. I've actually done it before, but you know, this, this is what we're talking about when, when we talk about working smart or creating systems versus hustling and burning yourself out. So I'm still trying to learn these concepts and I'm not a master of it. That's why I say I'm not done doing the Capital Razor show because I'm not the master of extracting myself from the business quite yet. But, you know, loving what you do is a big part of having success in life, I think. Yeah, and I think with the amount of things that happen, just just to find a deal close the deal, execute the deal. And then, you know, at some point down the road, you're trying to sell the deal 
And then you've got other investors, other deals that you're working on. It's a lot. I mean, we, CREI Partners, we've grown our staff and we did so in a way where, you know, uh, you know, part-time employees, it started with somebody who left the W2 world. And I was like, Hey, can I just have 10 hours of your time? Now, this is somebody I've worked with. I trust. And she's just blown it out of the park with our investor relations and just, you know, helping, helping that uh, brand and investor relations piece. And then um, she happens to be a twin. So like a few months ago, her, we brought her sister on board and then they like are like together, like this one perfect brand investor p- person. Cause they do a lot of the back of the house, uh, you know, marketing efforts through our YouTube and SEO and uh, all that good stuff. And then we've got a guy, uh, Carlos, who uh, is out, out of El Salvador and he's helping us find deals and, you know, making calls and, you know, this podcast that we're on right now, like he will be editing this podcast and put it on. And, and we've just, we've really, you know, you talk about time. There's only so much time where you, anybody has, right? And so shutting it down and uh, saying, all right, the next two weeks, or I'm, or I'm going to do a time slot, Ruben, where we're going to knock out three podcast shows and that gives you or gives us the ability to take off the next couple of weeks. You know, that's what's got to be done. So sometimes it gets to a point where you, we all have to add to our team, which adds more hours to your business, uh, even though there's some expense there for sure. But um, it sets Not it up for how. future growth. So, uh, so we'll see what 2023 brings It's It's super exciting. Uh, what, what 2023 goals, what do you, what do you got going on for next year? Survive. <laughs> Other than the book, we got the book. We got the book, the capital raising program. We got three deals. So like for me, like I've never developed anything. We got, you know, a $16 million, hundred unit, a $32 million, um, 158 and another 220 that we're about to take on and i'm like oh my god this is so much like you know you realize how mm-hmm. much capital we're gonna have to raise for this and my partner andy is just like yeah let's take on some more projects and i'm just like <laughs> trying to hold on for my dear life and he's like no we're we're in scale mode brother you know so i <laughs> love it it's uh, i just try, i'm just trying to hang on on this roller coaster you know while i'm doing all these other crazy things and see mm-hmm. if i can muster up the ability to continue to capital raise and and manage the business and manage people, manage co-GPs and yeah. take care of the house and all the other good <laughs> stuff in life and hopefully take some vacations. And, yeah. you know, one thing I got going for me is I have a Friday season pass to go snowboarding. So at least I can get away that day and then, nice. you know, so we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Andy McMullins, who we're talking about here, we're doing name drop. And uh, well, I'm on a call with them every Tuesday. You know, we're talking about the crest uh, and Doosan, Louisiana. And that, I'll tell you, the legacy team, you know, and I'm, you know, we're CIA partners. We do, you know, similar work, but Andy, Ruben, and the team, they're the real deal. They're, uh, I mean, every every week we're talking strategy and what we're doing. And that's what investors, that's what you want. You want, you know, the investors need to hear like, hey, these people that, you're trusting their capital with they're they're executing the business plan and so um and, and you know we're we're capital or we're partnering ruben with uh hammerhead capital yeah you know, boots on the ground you know so it's partners and relationships people you trust um but you know circling to this build to rent because i mean you do have a lot of projects that you are pushing out and it's a it is a lot especially in today's market of you know, everything else with the financial markets are tightening up and people are definitely being more mindful of how they're investing. So how, you know, let's talk about build to rent capital investing. What's the, what's your pitch on that when you're talking to investors and, you know, getting them comfortable yeah. uh, with, with the build to rent. Um, Let me give a 20 second blurb on the different multifamily sub niches, right? So you got a class multifamily B class, C class and then complete gut remodels where it's taken down to the studs. That's a D class or a complete remodel. And then, you know, you have a lot of people that are used to making a ton of money in B class and they're having a harder time getting deals to pencil because of the economic financing climate changes that are going on. 
So you see them moving away. They're getting into sub niches where there's less competition, assisted living, RV parks, self storage, mobile homes. And then you got these other group of people that are moving into development. They're getting into vertical multifamily, like guard, you know, four story garden style or podium style kind of buildings. And then you got this other class of investors that are building to rent, which is another sub niche of multifamily, even though they are detached houses, they're essentially an apartment unit with a backyard and a fence and a driveway. But essentially, they're the same size. They're like 1,200 square feet. They got two bedrooms. Everything's brand new. And the renters tend to like to stay in these places for 40 months. And one of the biggest killers of cash flow is turnover. So the idea is we buy, well, I should say, we buy the land, we entitle it, we put in infrastructure, we develop the thing out, we stabilize it along the way. And once the entire thing is built and it's completely rented, we a lot of times want to sell the entire subdivision to one individual institutional buyer. And there's an incredible, incredible demand from institutional buyers for this particular subdivision product because they've always wanted to own houses. But the problem with them owning houses is like the only way that they've been able to do it is by buying scatter sites or bulk REO packages back during the, the real estate crash of 2008. They used to buy packages of houses at like 20 cents on the dollar, billion dollar packages. They've always loved houses, but it's very challenging to property manage when somebody's got to bounce around all over the city or all over the county or in multiple states to take care of these properties. What they love about built to rent is it's one leasing agent. It's one property manager. Everything's brand new. There's no maintenance. It cl cash flows like crazy. The residents stay there like crazy. They get their own backyard and the doggy door. So it's just a, a while you see other people moving away from other kinds of deals, you see them moving into this space and it's a growing trend. And obviously everybody knows there's like a 4 million house shortage across the entire country so like there's a de demand from renters or people that need a place to live and if you know here's the other thing is houses are going down in price so if somebody's thinking about buying a house and they're going geez the prices are going down maybe i'll just wait six months and potentially i could buy a house cheaper in six months or fifty thousand dollars less than i could now but i don't want to live in an apartment where there's somebody across from me below me above me and on the left and right of me and i get you know i'm on the second story with a little balcony and you know i have to take all my furniture up and down stairs and like they, they don't want that experience anymore they want to live in a house so where are they going to live if they're not buying their own house because they can't afford it or because they want to wait because the house prices are going down they're going to go into a build to rent house where they got all of the, you know, the beautiful trees and the walking parks and the dog park and all that, you know, amenities and clubs and workout gyms and whatever else you may be offering. Um, I do want to differentiate, though, because I think a lot of people think that since I just mentioned the prices of houses are going down, the subdivision and house builders right now. You may have heard that they're kind of suffering, and that's absolutely true. But what they're doing is selling to individual retail buyers on the market, one house at a time. That's not what we're doing. We don't have the intention to do that. We don't like the idea of 280, you know, like going through a, a realtor and that kind of a closing. That's just like brain damage. So what we want to do is just build the thing out stabilize it, get it rented and sell the thing and then move on to the next project. And we want to do that over and over and create a velocity of money that we can get to the point where we can build some of these and keep, you know, keep one out of five. And then that's going to be our legacy that we get to hold these things that are brand new for as long as we can possibly uh, hold them. So that's kind of the idea behind Build to Rent. And that's why we love it. Yeah, no, it's great. And even though prices of houses may be going down, interest rates are going up it makes and it, it it still makes it pretty un, unaffordable to buy a house uh for many people so right. the idea of having a house that you can rent uh that's brand new that's brand new and you know you're in this community 
that has a lot of those amenities is, is huge. And yeah, it's definitely and close, to, it, and close to good schools. Yeah. And it started in it start in Arizona where you are. Like, okay. It did it, start here. Let's actually hold on. This is a really important point because the market is incredibly important when you're doing build to rent. So we get a lot of people that are asking, Hey, would you help us do a build to rent in Kansas city or in Portland or in Phoenix or in wherever? Um, and we don't want to, one of the reasons is because the bureaucracy, especially in a big metroplex like Dallas, Phoenix, Atlanta, they have so much stuff on their plate that they can't get you through the finish line. And as a syndicator of a subdivision, you want to get your money back to the investors as fast as possible. So we select secondary markets in the Southeast and Louisiana, Alabama. We're moving into Texas, Florida, North Carolina. But for now in Louisiana and Alabama, we're going to pro-growth cities, cities that want to provide their, their citizens with affordable housing. And so they'll help you get across the finish line extremely quickly, which benefits us as syndicators, because that means that we can get our investor capital back to the LPs very quickly. And on top of that, we mitigate some of the risk of development because we don't even start syndicating any deals until we've identified the property, put engineering in place, put in the infrastructure. And once it's shovel ready, with utilities, electric, roads, all of the, you know, the uh, the slabs of concrete are in place and the plumbing is in place. At that point is when we syndicate. So mm -hmm. from there to the point that we finish the houses, it's like 24 to 36 months maximum. Yeah. So, you know, by that These point- These houses go up, you know, six to eight, you know, you start six, six to eight at a time. Yeah. And so over, a, you know, a year- Maybe more than that, depending on the Maybe project. more, yeah. So, um, if weather, weather allow, mm -hmm. it's sometimes, you know, it rain, <laughs> some of these markets, like you don't realize like, you know, unless you're developing something or you got cows to feed, you're like, man, it's either raining a lot or not enough. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, cause yeah. you know, the, the Louisiana project this summer, it, it was nonstop raining. But then all of a sudden it's cleared up. So it's all good. Okay. We're, we're still on time. It's we're still on time, time. but man, it, it was rainy, rainy, but uh, no, that was a really good synopsis of the builder rent. I think that's huge. I think a lot of people, um, one don't know about that asset class. It's definitely a newer, uh, newer asset class that really, I think even accelerated during COVID, you know, a lot of these people, I mean, if I had a choice between an apartment or a house, you know, when I was in, in the renter stage, you know, all day, every day would be a house, you know? Um, so, yeah. And it, and if you're an LP, I think a lot of LPs, they want to imagine themselves living in the place that they're investing in. Mm -hmm. And if they're buying C-class kind of dungy stuff with like old seventies carpets and stuff in it, it's hard for them to imagine living in it. But if you see pictures of the stuff that Derek Alexandrenko is building mm -hmm. with like crown molding and concrete stained floors, luxury faucets. And uh, they're just incredibly beautiful with industrial fans. And it's just one of the most beautiful things. And not to mention it's brand new. So um, if we start implementing some technology and some USB ports right into the outlets and, you know, some like um maybe some cameras or some automatic, you know, enter the house with your smartphone and turn the air conditioner off with your smartphone, stuff like that, then it's going to be an explosion, right? I think people mm -hmm. will be dying for that product. So we'll see if we get into that. I think we are going to in 2023. Yeah. So when you are, uh, I mean, primarily focused on the Southeast, as you said, and a lot of your projects are in Louisiana and um, in Alabama. So, when we're looking for multifamily as most you know investors are it's location 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 job growth demographic yeah. you know demographic when it comes to income etc so are you, are y'all going through the same checkbox uh with your markets or what's it, the it's some it's all that? of that stuff plus we want pro growth cities mm -hmm. and then we want you know we're also considering and contemplating what is the land like is it flat or is it 
you know, mountainous or do we have to grade it? Is there a bunch of trees that we have to remove? Is there a lot of extra stuff that we have to do? Or is it just like this flat grassland that you barely have to do anything to it? So those are also things that we contemplate. But yeah, like you mentioned, you know, is the is the city growing? Is there a migration of people? We're interested in that. Is it the fastest growing county like Baldwin County in Alabama where we're investing? Um, in some cases, maybe... Is it an opportunity zone? That's something that would be of interest to us as well, right? So yeah. we're thinking about all these things. So investors, when you're talking to them, raising capital for these projects, they're obviously interested in the returns and when they're going to yeah. get some type of cash uh, flow. Uh, what type of investor are you really targeting? Fantastic. And question. what uh, what returns are reasonable? Not you know over yeah. the top to expect in these type of developments. So, so let's go back to the sub niches. A class, you're going to be cash flowing from day one and you're not going to make too much at the end. Hmm. B class is going to be a hybrid and C class or D class, you're not going to make as much cash flow and then you're going to get a big chunk at the end. When you're investing into a development project, let's just say, let's compare multifamily vertical versus multifamily horizontal, right? So a vertical would be a four-story garden, which you have to build the entire thing and then give concessions away to get people in. With the BTR, what we're doing is we're building 10 houses, we're renting them out, building another 10 houses, renting them out. So when we have 100 houses built, they're essentially all rented out. We don't have to give away concessions. We're charging full-blown market rents. And what can you, you expect to return to get as a return, we're essentially doubling people's money in the time that it takes from us to syndicate at infrastructure complete to have it completely stabilized and rented out, which we believe that we can do internally in 24 months. But that's a very aggressive time scale. So we underwrite it for five years and we tell people, hey, we can double your money in about five years. And if we do it quicker, that's gravy. So and we believe that we can. And, you know, because it's 506C, we can give you these kind of projected returns. And we believe that we'll hit them every time out of the park because this is exactly, it's, it's not like we're inventing this model. We're copying the DR Hortons and the other companies that, you know, all of them, have, we're following them into the same markets where they're doing the exact same thing that we want to do. So we're not right. doing anything too crazy. We're just We're just duplicating what the successful people do. Yeah, it's a good point because a lot of the developments they are doing right down the road is the DR Hortons and these other large home builders. Uh, the other thing I liked about the build to rent when we were going through the um, capital raise for the Crest uh, that I would just tell investors is they we don't have to wait for a certific certificate of occupancy for all 98 units to be complete to then rent, right? So you have this vertical multifamily project apartment building all those units have to be complete. It has to pass all these inspections before you can even open it to the public. Whereas like these build to rent homes, each home is its own certificate of occupancy. You know, once the inspections have passed, you can rent and then you can- I you didn't know. even think about that. That's a, that's a good Yeah, one. it's huge because I mean, there's some cash flow coming in, you know, that's helping, uh, you know, the operations of, of the project until it gets full steam ahead. So- um, yeah, I, I just think that is, and you know, when times get tough, you stop. I mean, you could you could potentially just stop the project and still have 30, 40 homes, whatever you've built up to that point, you know, still rented and going. And then you're you're sort of waiting until the tide turns to here's to another thing going. that I kind of uh, I want to bring up real quick because I think for people that are coming up in the multifamily syndication space, my my greatest invitation to you is to partner instead of with somebody that's at the same level as as you partner with somebody that's you got an incredible track record, you know, a thousand or two thousand houses, something like or I mean, um, uh, units. So like a thousand units of multifamily, you want to partner with somebody, add value to them. And you can actually do the same thing in funds, right? So instead of launching your own fund and doing something with it, like partner with an existing fund manager and. I would be happy to invite all of you guys that are like tired of dealing with, you know, having to find deals in the multifamily space that are tough to pencil with the economic climate. Like come work with us. We're accepting people as co-GPs. There's nothing illegal about that. You know, we would do an interview process with you, see if we're a great fit, see what your skills are. 
see what you can do to maintain legal status, you know, because to stay legally compliant within SEC guidelines, you have to be a participant, not a passive investor, but actually a JV and have ongoing duties. And it doesn't have to be you are 100% asset manager. Like we can take this matrix and be like, oh, you know, Wayne's going to do 80% of the management and then you can help him with some of the the back office stuff, you know, that he needs help with. And, oh, are you good at marketing? We need help with that. Oh, and you have board of advisory skills. Oh, and you can get a discount on materials and whatever your skill set is. If you do like 10 or 20 or 30 or 40%, we have you fill out this matrix and then we hand this over to our lawyer. And then he says, basically, this dude's going to be legally compliant as long as he does the things that he says he's going to do over the duration of the entire project. And that's how we can help you come in as a co-GP that not only brings equity and your other skill sets, but that participates. Or we can also contemplate doing like a fund structure or a fund to fund. So if you guys are interested in Bill to Rent, you know, I talked to either Wayne or myself. I mean, we're both here to answer questions. We both are passionate about this. Obviously, I could talk about this and capital raising for like the next 24 hours nonstop until my voice dies. But, you know, this is just a, it's a really fun business. It's very lucrative, not only for the LPs, but for the capital raisers, for the GPs, for the general contractors, for everybody involved. Yeah, I mean, really, the build to rent didn't even get on my radar until you and I connected last year. And since then, and really during once we met, like I went out to Louisiana, uh, walked the property, really tried to understand the market and and what what the vision is and and what the whole build to rent movement and development process is. So it's it's uh it's gonna continue growing and you're absolutely right. You know, partnering with a group like Legacy um, you know, is a smart thing to do. And you you said one thousand plus units, but you know you know, a group like yours uh, on that build a rent front is, is huge. The other thing too, I took away from that Ruben was everybody can bring something to the table. So many people are like, well, I, I haven't done a deal. I don't, you know, I don't know what mm-hmm. I can bring um, time, energy, oh, that's passion. Okay. Now I mean, you got me fired up. Dude, yeah. Because let's go you for get, it. You, <laughs> you get a lot of people in there. They, at the end of the networking call, they're like, what can I do for you? Or is there any way that I can be of service to you? Or, you know, and they may say this to another syndicator as well. And what that does is it requires the syndicator to try and dissect all of your skills and they don't have the bandwidth to know exactly what you're good at and what you're not good at. So instead of asking that question, how can I be of service to you? Or what can I do for you? Ask them this, hey, what's preventing you from scaling to 10 times and 10 X what you are currently doing and then shut up and listen to them. Hmm. And they'll be like, Oh man, if we had more capital, if we had more resources here, if, you know, if we had an interior designer that, you know, took stuff off the plate so that we can, instead of doing just three projects a year, we could do six and then find a way to fit in, you know, to get in where you fit in. Hmm. That is how you become a co GP guys. It's not by asking, Oh gee, how could I be of service to you? I mean, that's so cheesy and lame, guys. Like, pick up your game. Really, if you guys are serious about getting into this business, find a way to add value and be serious about it. Absolutely. Sorry to I just... No, it's me, huge. I'll, I mean, I'll, it, get off, it, I'll get off it, my soapbox. That's, <laughs> that's uh, and I, you know, we got a lot of passive investors that listen to. It goes across any industry and every... At the end of the day, people uh, who are willing and able and wanting to move up, they're finding... Uh, defining ways to add value, right? And taking the initiative to, f- to figure that out and, and deliver on it. And uh, so, uh, well, as we come up to um, sort of closing here, we've talked about, we've talked a lot in this, you know, certain amount of time. Any more on the build to rent, uh, capital raising, anything you want to, uh, top of mind that you want to close up with? And then I always ask the question, you, know, yeah. you answered it last year, is what's your proudest moment? And maybe we'll just do it for those past 2022. What's your proudest moment of 2022? Proudest moment of 2022. So we hit, I'd probably say like it, it's a podcast related goal. We broke a million downloads. We're currently sitting at 1.3 million. Oh, wow. Unbelievable. Like I could never have imagined that when I started three years ago. So that was pretty huge. Partnership with Richard Wilson was huge. Uh, 
yeah, I would say that those are two my two biggest deals, right? Like when you're associated with like a somebody that's got a billionaire club <laughs> and a family office club, and he will he specifically targets you, and then allows you to twist his arm to become a greater business part than he originally intended to. Like those, I would say that those are my proudest moments for sure. Love it, man. What uh, is there any anything else you want to uh, talk about with build a rent or, or capital raising to close this up? Just like just mindset, you know, like go out and do it, guys. Don't be afraid. Don't let your limiting beliefs prevent you from doing what you. If you, I mean, especially if there's a calling from inside your gut that's telling you I need to step up my game and self actualize, then get off of that analysis paralysis thing that you've been doing and take some action and that's how you break through your limiting beliefs i'll end it off with that love it all right so how can people find you they can go to the capital raiser show.com legacyacquisitions.com to find out either about how capital raising or our built to rent projects or if you just want to hang out like find me on linkedin i do a lot of you know business personal development kind of posts on there i'm really into peak performance and that kind of thing so follow my content or engage with me via LinkedIn messenger, Ruben right, breath. Well. well, thanks for being on our show. And uh, been a blast. obviously we'll, we'll keep staying in touch. Have a good one, man. Peace. That's all for this episode. We hope you subscribe, share, and leave a review of the show. For more information about passively investing in multifamily apartments, check out Wayne's free ebook by going to creipartners.com forward slash ebook. Also, follow us on Facebook by searching CREI Partners. This was the untold stories of real estate investing.